I'm Eitan Weinstein. And I'm Naor Menninger. And you're listening to Two Nice Jewish Boys. This podcast is made in collaboration with The Jewish Journal. We've talked about the Syrian civil war a lot on this podcast, but today it seems even more relevant than ever. When civil war broke out in Syria in 2011, the United States was very wary of getting itself embroiled in yet another conflict in the Middle East. With Iraq, Afghanistan, and trying to solve the longest standing conflict in the Middle East, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the U.S. had enough on their plates. But when you're the most powerful nation on earth, it's hard to stay neutral. Recently, President Trump announced that he would be leaving Syria, clearing the way for a Turkish invasion and leaving the Kurds in Syria to fend for themselves. This caused a bit of a stir, to say the least. But what was the extent of America's involvement in Syria? How big of a step was this, actually? And what does this mean for the future of a conflict that has been raging on for almost a decade? Today we're joined by Genia Fruman. Genia, Genia is a master's student of Middle Eastern studies at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and formerly a fellow at the Shacharit Institute, a think tank that seeks to build bridges between Israel's various communities. Genia is also a senior guide at the L.A. Meyer Museum of Islamic Art and an occasional speaker on subjects related to Middle Eastern history and modern-day Russia. We are very excited to be hosting Genia on the podcast today to talk about Syria. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. It's, uh, it's a great experience. I'm very grateful. So today Trump gave a speech. What did he say exactly? Well, he was essentially speaking about, I've, I've only heard part of it, but he was essentially speaking about the, the motivation for America leaving Syria. And that, I think it was essentially the first time when he described more or less in detail the fact that uh, the U.S. is supposed to leave Syria completely as part of the process that only already began, the, the majority of American forces going through, through the border into Iraq. But this time he was giving sort of the, the, the explanation or the, the, the basis, the foundation for his decision, um, which was, well, and again, if we were discussing his speech, it's also a question of where do we start? Because he was very, he was, as far as I heard, he was uh, putting, um, speaking a lot about the fact that America should not be embroiled in um, tribal wars and tribal wars that have been going on for, for decades and for, for long years. But again, it's a question whether how you treat America's status and position in the world and in the Middle East specifically, because uh, we need to remember that Trump would, did not speak about issues such as tribal wars before he he decided last year that the U.S. should leave Syria. So it's a question of, of relative position, and I think it has more to do, less to do even with, with Middle Eastern is issues and more with probably American political issues. But wasn't he promising, I mean, wasn't one of his campaign promises to defeat ISIS and get our troops out of Syria? Well, that, that's the point. But first of all, uh, the question <clears throat> is, what do you Our call, I mean American troops. Yeah, what, what, what do you call... <laughs> What do you call defeating ISIS? Because this, ISIS um, does not have territory under control, but they're definitely not defeated. And definitely a very active organization, and they're definitely very active in Syria. Some of it actually under the auspice, or at least with the knowledge of Syrian author uh, of uh, Turkish authorities, sorry, which were which are playing a big role in this in Trump's decision right now. As we know, Trump had a lot of conversations with uh, President Erdogan, and and uh, to some extent, it might be seen as if Erdogan was actually the one who convinced Trump to to go with that decision to to leave. To, to leave. But I think that the the question is what what do you mean mission accomplished? Mission accomplished is a term which is I think in modern day American history is is, is a touchy issue. Speaking about Iraq, etc. But also in Israeli history. Well, yeah. That's for sure, but I think that specifically for Americans, mission accomplished is 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 really a question that Americans should ask themselves. What does that mean? Whether the fact that right now ISIS does not have territory under their control does that mean that ISIS is defeated? <clears throat> if America leaves, does that mean that ISIS will not re resurge? If America leaves, does that mean that 
American uh, allies will feel safe and will have less problems. If America leaves, does that mean that there would fall away, that it would fall away a um, humanitarian disaster or whatever? So there are a lot of questions that follow that because if we're only dealing with that in, in you know in, in speaking points of American politics, I'm not sure that addresses the real issues on the ground in the Middle East and in Syria in particular. But I mean, it is because it's interesting. You mentioned kind of uh, uh, if we leave, will our allies feel safe? Uh, you know, in our in our in our in our treaties and our agreements. But it's important to remember that I don't think the the Americans and the Kurds are formally allies they might have sort of like a truce in warfare but turkey is an american ally well the, ag technically again that's the, the 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 difference between you know your interests or the way that you promote your policy and legal uh, status of course turkey is american america's ally as a member member state of nato but the question is whether the, the the Turkish government promoting their interest, and obviously the Turkish army is the second biggest one in NATO after the American, um, whether if that serves the United States. And that's a big question because uh, Kurds have never been, a, and they've. it's not that America and, and, and Kurds in northern Syria, which are, it's, it, that opens a whole question about when we're speaking about the Kurds, what does that mean? But the Kurd, the Kurdish powers, the, the the Syrian Democratic Forces in northern Syria, have always had close relationship with the U.S. since the beginning of the Syrian civil war. That means that they're definitely have been American allies for the last eight years or so. So the question is whether the, this alliance, this connection with Syrian Kurds, would that serve America less than? Um, accepting uh, Erdogan's strategic positions, than than accepting his propositions and 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 supporting his line in that conflict. So that's another question. Again, for in order to 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 debate that, we need to to look at at specific issues or specific relationships between groups and countries and and movements in the Middle East within wider context. Because if we say that Americans leave and that's and that's fine and and and, and that means that mission accomplished. We don't really deal with the real plot problems. I think that one of the reasons why American foreign policy in the Middle East more or less failed during the last two decades was also due to th that sort of, of approach. Uh, I think that this, this approach was also vi very visible at the end of the war in Afghanistan in 1989. The Soviets left, so the um, say political position within American mainstream was to say, well, that's it. Mission accomplished. We've finished that. The Soviets are, are, are out, and, and that's it. But, of course, the results of a decade-long war in Afghanistan drew or brought about something much more serious. And the fact that the American government never really dealt with that seriously during the 90s made Afghanistan into the hub of the Taliban and the center of action of Osama bin Laden, which, of course, led to American invasion after 9-11 in, in 2001. So... Many of those issues are interconnected. You really can't treat them only as uh, political points or as parts of, of promises of American politicians. Now, I'm not saying that they should not promise things. I'm just saying that if we're dealing with foreign policy, especially in the Middle East, we need to understand the, the repercussions or the results of such decisions and what that might bring on a longer ter term. So what are the results of this decision? I mean, how is this bad? For the average American, well, that's all. Well, that's a different question about foreign policy. I'm not sure that the, for majority of Americans, I guess foreign policy in general is not very relevant. I suppose that a country which is so vast and so powerful and has so and plays so such a big role in the world, the particular political geopolitical decisions are not relevant for each American citizen, unless. The, something drastic and dramatic happens exactly so meaning if a third world war breaks out then of course obviously. but but that yeah, but even if we don't go as far as speaking about third world war we're also speaking about the repercussions of say the the damage to america's status in the world the the, the standing of america and, and the, the the powers that that are allied to america have a reper have repercussions in terms of strengthening other powers there's no vacuum neither in the middle east or nor i think generally of course, President Trump built a big part of his his campaign and his presidency 
on that rivalry with China. Of course, the status of China in, in, within uh, in the e economy and the influence of that upon American economy. But we need to remember that if the U.S. leaves, I'm not even speaking about allies, if the U.S. just, just leaves some areas and, and says, as President Trump said, let them deal with their own problems by themselves, there is no vacuum. Other powers, whether that's Turkey or Russia or China or radical Islamists or Iran or whatever, will enter that domain and they will play a great power and they will not give up on the cha their chance to, to influence and they will not give up their um, seat at the table. And when the U.S. will need to make decisions connected to other geopolitical issues, it will have to um, understand or, or, or at least conceive the fact that the reality that was, say, 20 years ago when American standing in the world was perhaps on its highest scale ever, and the situation today is very much difficult, different. And the fact that, you, you know, the American government will say, we're the most powerful nation we have, we're playing the biggest role we can, you know, put sanctions on whoever we, we want, that will not have the same effect as it had 10 years or 15 years ago. And that will def definitely influence also American internal policy, or also influence American economy, etc. So, uh, but I'm trying to, let's maybe, for our listeners and for me, um, kind of lay down the, uh, the, the, the facts for, that's surrounding this particular issue. So mm. how many U.S. troops kind of were in, I mean, roughly, I don't know if you have the exact numbers, but how many no. U.S. troops were actually on the ground in Syria? What was done just now? And, and does it really have that big of an effect of what happened on, on the ground? Well, the effect is also the result of the shift of American policy. There were, on the ground, there were approximately about 2,000 American soldiers, mostly dealing with, with support of, of um, special forces and uh, support of uh, airborne operations, usually air cover, which was very significant for the, uh, for the Syrian Democratic Forces, the, the Kurds, in their war against ISIS. Uh, of course, one of the reasons for... Assad's military victory in the civil war was the fact that he had an, an air umbrella provided to him by Russia. So the air forces are very, playing a very significant role in that. So ne Assad didn't try to invade the Turkish territories? Assad never reached actually Turkish territories. A Assad has been in control of... I meant, I mean, sorry, I meant Kurdish. Uh, there was the, the relationship between the Assad regime and the Syrian Democratic Forces is essentially that they're not friends, but both sides understand that their interest in getting into armed conflict is, 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 is not there, meaning that uh, Assad was willing to accept the semi-autonomous status of northeastern Syria as far as uh, th that territory, the, the Syrian Democratic which Forces is, did not. Which is kind of, I, I heard a theory that, 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 which is one of the reasons that we're actually allied with the Kurds in, in the first place, because when Obama was in the midst of kind of trying to to strike a deal with Iran, and he was he drew a red line in the sand in Syria, then he had to he wanted to ally. He couldn't really ally with himself with anybody that was fighting against Assad, who was basically a proxy of Iran. So he had to find someone that was kind of okay with Assad. Well, that that's also a question. I I think that the connections between the, the U.S. and and the northern Syrian Kurds are go, go before I'm, I, I I suggest like the, the the decisions of Obama during his second term to 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 get closer to Iran. But uh, the, I I guess that some of that is is true. But uh, we need to remember that the relationship between uh, the Kurds or the Syrian Democratic Forces, that not just Kurds. And the Assad regime are based upon the recognition of, at least generally, the borders of Syria. The, the Kurds in Syria did not want to create a different country. They mm -hmm. wanted to keep their uh, sp specific autonomous status in northern Syria. Assad was willing to accept that as long as the Kurds did not support the opposition against him, mostly Sunni Islamic movements during the last few years. And those forces, the Islamic forces, were usually supported by Turkey. I see. That's Which is, but the Kurds are different than the Iraqi. The Iraqi Kurds do want an autonomous. Okay, so here we enter the whole complexity of the relationship of between the, the the Kurdish different areas. Since Kurdistan, historic territory, Kurdistan is divided between uh, four different states, which are each one has completely different status and completely different history, which is Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. We need to 
point out that there are differences between political and, and military movement of the Kurdish uh, population. That means that Iraqi Kurdistan, which is an autonomous area, which is technically part of Iraq, but generally enjoys de facto independence to, to a certain extent, is controlled by mostly two main movements of two families, two clans, the Barazani and the Talibani families, which are um, have, have been actually in charge there for a long period of time, even since the times of Saddam Hussein from, from the 1990s. But they do have a different political approach, and they were trying, at least during the last few years, to reach independence. Now, there's a whole discussion whether that was a correct decision. There was a lot of opposition within uh, the Kurdish community for the, the, the attempt of President Barazani of the Kurdish autonomy in Iraq to reach uh, independence, and eventually that attempt failed. Essentially, that weakened Iraqi Kurdistan and brought about more influence of Iran within Iraq. But the Kurds in Syria are far closer to the huge Kurdish population in Turkey. Tur Kurdish population in Turkey is seen by the administration of President Erdogan and essentially by the whole um, nationalist Turkish movement as a real danger to Turkey terrorist as a unified organization. Uh, the, the PKK, the Kurdish Workers' Party, is a terrorist organization and it has been uh, considered so also in the West. But we need to look at it again on a wider scale. The PKK is one movement for many Kurds, they represent a movement which is fighting against a very vicious repression by the Turks even before Erdogan. We need to remember that. that this struggle has been going on at least since the foundation of the PKK in 1978 and perhaps even earlier on because the, the fact that uh, Kurds in Turkey have almost never had any community rights, they've, they're, even the fact that they're different people was denied for a long period of time. So for them, that's a big issue. And the fact that the PKK, is considered, which is a terrorist organization, is considered to be their, say, most prominent political and, and military movement is, of course, uh, looked upon as, as a significant danger to Turkey by the Turkish uh, establishment, not only actually by Erdogan and the Islamist forces, but by the majority of Turkish movement, political movements. And that's the reason why have, we've, we've seen that even the Turkish opposition, even, even the people who are usually critici fiercely criti criticizing Erdogan for turning Turkey essentially into, into a police state, into a dictatorship, even they were not able to criticize him for his decision to move forces into Syria. That proves a lot about the Turkish, say, political environment or political climate that, that would not allow you, even if you're in opposition to the government, would not allow you to treat the Kurds favorably. Meaning it's that taboo. Yeah, exactly. Why did, why did Erdogan ask now from Trump to do this move? That's a good question. I'm, I'm not sure I can answer that. I can tell you, though, that the, um, during the last few months, there have been um, more, let's say, an, a pattern of, of relationship that became warmer between Erdogan and President Putin. He's meeting yesterday in, uh, they're mi meeting yesterday in Sochi, in, um, in Russia, lasted for more than six hours. Sort of shows us that there are a lot of, connections there are a lot of there's a lot of let's say a closer relationship going on between the two presidents now i don't know whether the, whether the fact that erdogan pushed into specifically this operation right now had something to do with some agreements that he has with putin and russia but that may be so however it should be noted that that's not really the first time they're doing that even uh, before operation the operation the turkish operation in syria there've already been turkish forces in syria for a long time some syrian uh, towns along the border are under turkish control for more than a year now so the the presence of turkey within that conflict the, the fact that turkish government supports uh, islamist militias which are in control of, say, northwestern areas of Turkey, of uh, Syria. The fact that these, uh, the, the involvement in Turkey, of Turkey within that, in that conflict, and the fact that it supports different so forces, and one may even say that uh, the, the, the way that Turkey acted in 2014-15 was one of the reasons for the strengthening of ISIS, because 
when that territory was under ISIS control, Turkey was one of the first and foremost powers that helped ISIS, for example, export the oil that was under their control in Syria. Because ISIS are Sunnites. Yeah, ISIS is... And uh, Turkey is Sunnite. Exactly. And we need to remember that uh, the, the government of Erdogan essentially is an Islamist government. It's, of course, it's not similar to ISIS as an organization, but of course they look upon ISIS and Al-Qaeda and uh, the Sunni Islamist radical, what they, what they call radical organization, organizations, is very difficult from the way that they look upon the Kurds. Because as you said, the Kurds are a taboo. And mm-hmm. the Sunni radicals, maybe they're not very favorable. Maybe you don't, maybe... Like Itamar ben for us. Um, well, I, I think I, <laughs> I, I, I'd say that probably um, the Islamist movements are a little bit more dangerous than Itamar ben But uh, for, for... No, but in, in Erdogan's eyes, are they doing God's work or are they these... Crazy yeah, this extremists. little annoying little brother no, that I, you need I, to smack from time to time. I'd say that they are mostly serving a lot of Erdogan's interests. Of course, again, That's you're right. You need to smack God's them work. once in a while, but uh, they're essentially much of m- many of them are under his control, or at least under the understanding that he won't do anything but real. But isn't it safe to say that Erdogan is watching as Iran is becoming more and more dominant? Because what does Iran want to control the Middle East? And is it safe to say that Erdogan wants it as well? And as he sees that Iran, which is Shiite, is becoming stronger, he feels left behind and wants to have a better grip in his... Well, well at least think... he feels it on his front doorstep. We need to remember that Iran, that's not you for Turkey. I mean, the, the, the sort of neo-imperialist or neo-Ottoman approach of Erdogan is not a result of the last two years. It's very visible in his foreign policy for more than a decade or so, I think, because he's obviously trying to rebuild the status of Turkey as the, the as an international protector of Sunni Muslims. It's very visible, actually, in eastern Jerusalem. If you go to East Jerusalem, you will see a lot of Turkish flags. You will see a lot of portraits of Erdogan. You will see a lot of organizations being found, founded by, by... Funded. Funded, sorry. That were, some of them were actually also founded, but yes, but being funded by yeah. by uh, Turkish or Turkish affiliated organizations. So you see that the 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 fact that that Erdogan is these making, organizations are not big supporters of Zionism. N- no, not not really, not big supporters of Israel, and that's also one of the reasons that Erdogan is making the Laksa Mosque and the temple, the question of the Temple Mount, very prominent in Turkish foreign policy and in his speeches. That's something. Pretty much unprecedented. There had never actually been a Turkish prime minister or president who spoke about you know all Islamic values and the protection of Al-Aqsa and all of those things that we usually hear from Hamas. Usually, we usually hear from Islamist organizations. And so, just just to make this, maybe the, the listeners missed that point. Turkey is financing legally, right, NGOs in Israel that are opposing Israel in East Jerusalem. No, no. It, these are Israeli NGOs. They're, 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 they're. No, some of them are not re- registered. Many of them are actually not registered in, re- registered in Israel. But they're definitely acting on Israeli territory. It's also you need to remember we were speaking about Israel, East, East Jerusalem, but the connections of, say, the Islamic movement in Israel to Turkey also exists. Now I can't really. I'm not not. I'm not researching NGOs, so I can't really speak for sure. But there are definitely connections. It's it's not rare for representatives of of Israeli Islamic movements to go to Turkey. It's obviously the the as I, I, I suppose at least some of your listeners know the different movements affiliated with the Islamic with the Muslim Brotherhood, which are spread all across the Muslim world. You have them around the Middle East, you have them in Central Asia and East Asia and Africa, etc. All of those movements are essentially taking their um, foundation or their, their principal ideas from the development of the Muslim Brotherhood. And in that case, Hamas or the Islamic movement in Israel or the Turkish uh, uh, AKP, the, part, the Erdogan's party, or any of the other Islamist parties are essentially related it's very clear that they have connections. It's very clear that they're based on the same principles. And hence, it's not very surprising that Erdogan, with his neo-Ottomanist approach, is trying to present himself as a protector and promoter of those values. 
again, of course, as a counter counterpower both to to Iran and the Shia world, but also in co in, in contrast to the West, which is obviously being represented mostly by the United States and, of course, by Israel. Will there be a war between Turkey and Iran and Assad? Well, that's a good question. I, I I'm not think I don't think that that's uh, that's Turkey's interest. I also, as 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 far as I can tell from the coordination between Erdogan and President Putin, the coordination is deep enough in order for us to not have any kind of real war in Syria, since n the Assad regime, Syria in general, cannot m act independently without uh, permissions from the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. By now, Assad is completely dependent on Russia. And of course, if Russians are accepting the presence of Turkish support, Turkey supported uh, or forces supported by Turkey in northern Syria, uh, then obviously Assad will accept that too. Now, with regard to Iran, that's a different question. I think that has a lot to do with the fact that neither Iran nor Turkey are currently on a on a path to direct conflict. Iran does not need any sort of that conflict since it is in a very difficult economic situation and also Turkey is and Turkey also is not really in great shape in and inflation and yeah the Turkey obviously one of the, the the that you know sort of imperial spin of Erdogan sort of w w did not reflect very well on on Turkish policy uh, huge Turkish loans economy. right yeah a lot of loans a lot, and and uh, the high level of corruption and you see that with with elections in Turkey you saw that the the candidate of of uh, Erdogan's party lost the mayoral elections in Istanbul, which was a significant stronghold for him. Erdogan himself was a mayor of Istanbul in the 1990s. So uh, that's that, that's obviously not very... I, I guess that Erdogan is a person with, with a very touchy ego is not very pleased with that. But um, So you see that. But on the other hand, of course, none, neither the Iranian regime nor Erdogan himself don't want to give up on their sort of semi-imperial status. So they will keep working as far as they can, as long as they can also not enter direct conflict. So let, I want to pull us back a bit to mm -hmm. kind of what happened in the in the past in the few invasion, days. Invasion, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. what? So we we said there was about two thousand American soldiers on the ground. How many were moved and from where? I think that by now about half of them were already moved from the areas more adjacent to the Turkish uh, Syrian border into the to the north uh, east mostly to the area of the Iraqi Syrian border some of them have already crossed the border into Iraq so about a thousand soldiers were spread across the border or treated no i'm saying they were spread across the so border some between, positions in between some Syria and Turkey yeah. in some bases and then they retreated yeah. and left open basically for Erdogan to go in yeah and and the 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 SDF the the Kurds would actually actually preferred for Assad's forces to capture some of those areas in order for Turkey not to do that the, the one of the ways that i know that is that for example i'm following on facebook this russian journalist who's been spending his last, I think, five years maybe, in uh, Syria as a um, sort of following Assad's forces. And he had documented the, the, what's going on there from the point of view of Assad's army. Uh, he has been documenting the, essentially the victory of Assad over the, the Sunni rebels, the, 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 what used to be um, uh, opposition of uh, op opposition to Assad. Now he's of course he's doing that from a very pro-Assad uh, position, but it's still very interesting to see that. And just a few days ago, he uploaded a few photos from uh, an American base in al along the border near I think um, don't remember, I think it's yeah near Kobani, which was the city that the Kurds defended from ISIS in 2014. Um, and he was actually the first journalist to enter that basis, and he took some photos with, you know, um, items, American items and American flags that were there, etc. So it's obviously very clear where that is going. So uh, the, the moment Americans left, somebody entered that vacuum, whether that were those were the Syrian forces of Assad or those were the Islamist militias that Turkey supports coming from the north. So these 1,000 soldiers, according to the situation that you're describing, were actually holding off the Turkish army? They were. I, I won't say that they were holding off the Turkish army in military terms, but they were definitely a deterrent. I mean, the, the, as far as Americans were there and they were covering the, the Kurdish operations, they were um, sort of 
the symbolic, therefore, the presence for the American support of the SDF, SDF and American support of the fight against ISIS by the Kurds. The moment they left, that was a very clear sign to Erdogan and to Turkey that they can essentially promote their policy at least to some level, because uh, it's not that Erdogan is trying to conquer all of Syria. He's trying to create this sort of territory about 30 or 40 kilometers into Syrian into Syrian territory, which would be under the control of his militias, of his of the militias that he supports. And he would be able to repopulate those areas, of course, after the Kurds have left. We're already speaking right now, I think, about more than 200,000 Tur- uh, Kurdish uh, refugees living those areas. So he will be able to repopulate those areas with Sunni refugees from the war, people who are living in refugee camps in Turkey, and some of them in northern Syria. And if he manages to repopulate that area with them, he will have a very efficient um, sort of blocking area. So he would have a a territory that would divide the Kurds in Syria and the the very big Kurdish population in Turkey. So for him, that would be a strategic success. He will make... Essentially, he will divide divide the Kurdish population into two parts, and he will create a situation that will uh, make it much easier for him to act against uh, Kurdish militias, especially the PKK in Turkish. How many people, how many civilians died by the Turkish army? In in Syria right now? Right, in the, yeah, in the last two well, weeks. Well, first of all, the majority of, of, of actions on the ground are, is not actually Turkish army. Those are the, the, the Islamist Sunni militias which are being supported by the Turkish army. Turkey is essentially providing support in terms of artillery and air force. Uh, they have some forces on the ground, but they're relatively limited. Um, now, I, I, I'm, I won't get into specific numbers because I'm really, I have serious difficulty to understand what's true and what's not. But we are speaking here about at least a uh, few hundred of c- civilians that were killed by those bombings and and, uh, and there was talk and about operations. hundreds of thousands that were hundreds displaced. of thousands that were displaced yeah at least 200,000 people any displaced. sorry for the naive question but like a UN resolution a international war what we laws s- what we that's s- not a naive n- that's not a naive question but that, that's an <laughs> that's interesting point Turkey on is in the <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's an interesting point because um, what, what was about a year and a half, week and a half ago? Sorry, the the attempted re- re- UN resolution that was promoted by um, the UK and France uh, in the Security Council was blocked at the same time by time by the US and by Russia, which is I think the one of the as far as I remember that I don't remember any other case when both countries actually voted against a resolution that was brought about in the Security Council. Usually it's the one blocking the other and vice versa. So this is a unique situation which Russia and America are actually voting against a resolution that was trying to uh, to treat that that the, the Turkish actions as an aggression. But doesn't it kind of make sense that Trump would I mean he also feels this pressure of the Iranian dominance in the Middle East and kind of uh, encroaching on Syria and I mean as as Assad's forces gain more control uh, and even even ally with the Kurds then you know Iran has more of a proxy in Syria so doesn't it make sense that he would kind of want to open the floodgates and let the Turkish uh, forces or at least Turkish supported forces who are I mean the Turks are an, a NATO ally kind of I get serve as a balancing power in this whole conflict well, instead of stand aside and say, okay, let's 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 draw this border with these thousand troops and let kind of Iran gain more and more dominance. Well, first of all, I think that it will be more true to describe Assad as Russia's proxy, not as Iranian proxy. Now, Iran has a lot of influence in 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 Syria, has sorry, a lot of power, but. Uh, I think that that Syria is much more a Russian proxy. Now, the result of what happened right now is essentially the fact that President Putin turned into a very powerful figure right now in the Middle East. The, actually, he's the one now calling the shots. He's the one now ca- uh, coming to agreements and 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 um, discussions with the Turks about separation of forces, about humanitarian corridor corridors, about the the preservation of the autonomy in northeastern Syria, at least to some extent. So now uh, 
Putin is the person who's who's very much powerful with the, that, that connection. And Iran, by now, which is obviously rival and enemy for the United States, is now not in a conflict in, with Sunni powers. Right now, Iran and Syria as, as, as a military force are not in direct conflict with the Sunni militias in northern Syria because neither Erdogan nor Putin want that. And as far as they it, it considers them, I think that they would be interested to preserve that reality at least to some extent. The result of that would be probably more power both to Iran, both uh, actually three sides. It's Iran, Russia, of course, and Turkey. In that case, the fact that uh, Turkey is a NATO member state does not mean much because it's obvious that President Erdogan is following his own line. He doesn't really care about NATO. He's, up, he's very clearly threatening European nations that if they try to coerce him into something, he will open the gates and let the Syrian refugees flood Europe, which is a very powerful weapon, obviously. And for him, he has his own interests. So the question is, the decision of President Trump to take those forces out of Syria what is exactly the positive result of that on American interest? How does that weaken any sort of force that may threaten America, whether that's the Islamist powers supported by Turkey or the Shia forces supported by Iran or if it's Russia? So, so that's what, a question. I'm, I'm, not, I'm what, not declaring that. I'm what could asking. be if you had to kind of uh, surmise? It's a good question. I think that um, probably the U.S., uh, is trying to to it's not new i think that that uh, president obama was trying to follow a similar line of america trying to show that it's not into you know regime changing and all of those things that are i i've just seen that i think on on twitter that that this this debate about whether hillary clinton represents the the sort of aggressive uh, res regime changing line and there are op there's an opposition to 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 that from both sides and that's that creates a very strange relationship in which you know Tulsi Gabbard from the Democratic Party and Rand Paul from the uh, from the Republican side are actually speaking in the same language about that so this is of course you you, you can speak about that I, th I I think that maybe for for many people that would be relevant of course in the middle east nobody wants their regime to be changed but on the other hand we need to ask ourselves what is the result of letting everybody you know deal with their stuff as trump says now i don't know i I'm, i can't really foresee the future and the question is whether we're taking those chances while trying to achieve something specific currently i can't really tell what is what are the objectives or the goals of american foreign policy under trump I, I, I'm not saying that they're definitely not there and that what he did, did, what he did is definitely sp stupid, but I just can't really understand what they're trying to achieve. So we will just have to wait and see, I guess. Well, yeah, that, as Trump puts it, usually we'll have to see and w wait and see. I think as he put it, it was mm. sometimes you got to let the kids fight a bit and then you rip them apart. <laughs> yeah, well, the question again, <laughs> the question is how do you do that and what exactly are you tr will you do after they, they get into that fight? And then we need to remember that repercussions of this fight are very significant for Israel. And that's a question of, you know, people are saying, well, it doesn't really concern us right now, right? It, it's it's uh, Turkey and Syria and let Ru the Russians deal with that, et cetera, et cetera. But all of that plays a big role in what's going on on the northern border of Israel. That's Syria and that's also Lebanon, which which actually is, is being at least partially controlled by one of the strongest Iranian uh, proxies in the world, Hezbollah. So the, this is a, a touchy issue, and I'm not sure we can have real answers on w what is going on here, at least we, uh, until we, we see uh, the results of that in, in, I don't know, a year or two, or at least. In the form of a thousand rockets. So. Well, that, I, I, again, I'm not <laughs> sure that it's, uh, it's, very, uh, that it's the interest of, of, of uh, Hezbollah to go to war in is with Israel. And as, right if, now they uh, have other problems. Yeah, right, if, if you're following, you know, the... the, the Lebanese revolution, hashtag Re Lebanese revolution on, on Twitter, you will see some pretty amazing uh, uh, yeah. videos from the demonstration. What, what's going on? The, the, really, the, <coughs> the fact that so many people from in Lebanon from different groups, from different creeds, from different communities 
are all protesting against the government and 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 Hezbollah and, in against, and against actually Corruption. also Hezbollah. You see, suddenly you see it's it's not it's relatively minor, but you see even Shia Muslims in Lebanon pro- protesting against what's going on there. Meaning that they don't maybe they don't declare that in those words, yeah. but they're essentially protesting what Hezbollah is doing. So that's also a different. You know, that, that's an issue which is relevant to Lebanon specifically. But I think that when we're dealing with the results of American policy in northern Syria, in Iraq, with regard to what Turkey is doing, all of those actions will have repercussions both on uh, American allies in the Gulf, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, which are obviously significant ally, and on Israel. And that's important to understand. Before we talk about the amazing museum you work at, let's mention our sponsors. The Chosen... The one Chosen One card game. Card game. So, guys, you can check them out at thechosenonegame.com. Uh, it's a hilarious game. It's basically question and answer cards. We've played it already on a few episodes, and uh, you guys should check them out, thechosenonegame.com. Basically, you get these like question and answer cards. One person reads a question, the other person reads a random answer, and they're hilarious Jewish combination. One of our listeners told us they were playing it like three couples, and it, it was hilarious and... And they oh, yeah, loved yeah. it. That's right. And uh, if you go to the website and you put uh, uh, the code... 2NJB. Right? 2NJB. The number 2NJB. So you can actually get a discount. Yeah. Um, so go there, check it out, get a discount. It's a hilarious and game. And support the show and by doing the that. Show. So, Genia, you work at the... How, how's it called? The It's called the L.A. Mayer Islamic uh, Art Institute or Museum, but essentially they usually call that the Islamic Art Museum because in there's Jerusalem. only one in Jerusalem, only one in Israel, essentially. Um, I'd say that this is a, a, a unique institution. First of all, it's one of the first completely private museums founded in Israel. And second of all, it was founded by a British Jew which is also an amazing story. Uh, in the 1920s, a woman named Vera Bryce Solomon, so daughter of a well, very wealthy um, Jewish-British family, came to Jerusalem. She actually came from Zionist motives, uh, but she dealt a lot with um, donating money and funds to social care. She was very interested in caring for the elderly, which was, you know, the term of home for the elderly was relatively new at that time. So she was the first to, to, to fund and support organizations like that. In Jerusalem, she met Professor Arya Leo Meyer, who was one of the founders of the Hebrew University. He was, uh, I think, the third rector of the university. He was actually one of the first archaeologists to deal with Islamic archaeology in the Holy Land. Um, he was he was trained in, in in Austria, and he came here after World War One. But he was really one of the one of the let's say more most interesting um, intellectual figures at that time. They were ver- they were very close. And when Professor Meyer passed away in 1959, she decided to commemorate him with a museum that would be dedicated to his field of work and will also act as a sort of window for Israeli population to the world of Islam, not through our, you know, news. We were just speaking about the news, which are usually not very good at all. So that was a chance to deal with our world through art, through craft, through, through the beauty of art. And with her support, the building of the museum was built and a collection was uh, gathered for about 15 years. The museum, that was a completely private initiative. Uh, the museum opened in 1974, already after she passed away. But that really is, a, I think, a unique institution in terms of both the message and the fact that it's also presenting, uh, you know, civilization through art in a way that would be um, approachable for essentially every group that there is in Israel, whether that Jewish Israelis, and we're working a lot with Jewish schools, whether that would be the Arab sector, including schools from East Jerusalem, which is a separate educational system, or whether that would be tourists or people who are coming to visit uh, Israel and Jerusalem and are trying to, to get sort of a grip, a wider grip on what's going on in the history of our area. So I think that the, the fact that we're able to provide that um, uh, that sort of 
view right. that's sort so, sort of point of view sort of sort of way of looking at it and getting the, that impression is unique i would also say that we have one collection that does not have anything to do with islamic art and that is also a personal gift of the Solomon's family to the museum. The clocks? The watch collection, exactly. That's mm -hmm. the, the family collection, actually, the life achievement of Sir David Solomon's, Vera Solomon's father, uh, which she donated to the museum after she inherited it. And this is really one of the biggest and, and actually first collections of watches and mechanic instruments that, would, that was ever collected. So Solomon's was a pioneer in that field. So we're holding here... Well, one, one collection which is a sort of a commemoration of the beauty of Europe and the story of European Jew, Jewish families in the 19th century and the big collection which is dealing with the world of Islam. So, so now, you, real quick, you got to tell the amazing story of the theft. Yeah, that's I, I've actually spoken about that once on radio. Um, in uh, April 1983... Um, there was a theft from the museum. Actually, the collection today the collection is kept in a vault, so it would be much more difficult. But uh, then the collection was not kept very well. It was actually in in a in, in a storage. In, in, no, it, it was <laughs> it a... was on presentation, but really not very well kept. And uh, that was uh, Saturday night, which was uh, the night of uh, Erev Yom Zikaron, the night of of Israeli Remembrance Day. And uh, th that night, 106 objects, including Marie Antoinette's personal watch, which is, uh, well, you can look it up online, which is probably, I think, the gem of our collection, one of the most expensive watches ever made. Uh, 106 objects, including that, that watch, were stolen. For 23 years, there was no information about what happened to the collection, until in 2006, an Israeli art dealer called the museum telling that he was approached by an Israeli lawyer who represented this woman, this widow from abroad, from the United States, who inherited the family collection, and she wanted to sell some of those items. Now, I won't really go into the details, so everybody should, should look that up themselves, but what happened was that during two years and a half, more or less, there was an international operation involving the FBI and the Interpol, during which five different sites on three different continents were found, in which the uh, the stolen items were found, 96 actually out of 106 were found, including about 40 of them, which were disassembled part by part and kept in you know cardboard box boxes and and and, and packages and 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 plastic bags, etc. And and there was a whole story. There was almost a year of work of restoration and returning those items and re rebuilding them essentially and th until the collection was reopened and in 2009. Marie Antoinette's watch was never uh, disassembled. The, the, the watch is made found. by... It was found, yeah. Wait, but what happened? <laughs> well, <laughs> Who that, did it? We don't know. No, uh, we, we uh, actually know. Oh, uh, uh, we know? Uh, well, the, the, the collection was stolen by an Israeli man named Naaman Lidor, or Naaman Diller, which, uh, who was actually a member of a kibbutz. He was known as the kibbutznik thief. Um, he <laughs> was thrown out of the Israeli, military, uh, Israeli army flight course actually because he, he flew a training airplane above his uh, right above his kibbutz when uh, Lord Rothschild was visiting. <laughs> um, and during the late 60s and oh, early God. 70s, he was probably one of the most well-known thieves in Israel. It needs to be pointed out that he worked completely alone. He was not very much involved in the Israeli crime scene. There's a whole theory, which is, I think, very logical, that was that he was essentially trying to prove the establishment that he can. He was trying to prove people that he was smarter. And he really did some some pretty incredible thefts, thefts at that time, of course. One of them was in was on Israeli on Rosh Hashanah on Israeli New Year's when he during the week before that he dug a tunnel into the ventilation shaft of a um, vault of a bank in Tel Aviv. Yeah, that's a famous so, one. Yeah. And, and no. he stole how? He what? stole no. He stole some some jewelry and money. But the problem is was that he returned the next night in order to continue his work within that vault. And there he was caught because the neighbors called. And they heard some noise. Now the, <laughs> and he was arrested. He, he was arrested. He spent some time in jail. Um, when he was he, he came out of jail, he left for Europe. He spent some time in in the Netherlands. He went to the United States. He then in the United States he married an ex-Israeli who he knew from Israel. She's a Hebrew teacher in Los Angeles. And when he passed away in 2004, she inherited 
whatever he had. And she was the one to hire that Israeli lawyer who called that Israeli art dealer in an attempt to sell some of those items. But they didn't actually, so she didn't sell them back in the end. They were, they were. There there was a whole process. Actually, in the beginning, the, the museum did not go to the police because the fear was great that, you know, if you turn to the police, everything will disappear. So if, in the beginning, the museum was had some negotiations. They paid some money, but not a very significant sum. I need to point out that the Marie Antoinette watch is valued today at approximately $35 million, maybe. So uh, the, the money there was really minor in those terms. But uh, after some information came from other Israeli art dealers, the police got involved. And the, the fact that the police got involved reached the connection with the FBI that found the seller, uh, Naman Lido's widow, who lives in Los Angeles, Los Angeles. And from there, there was this long process of finding all of those vaults and private safes, etc. Cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But was she, I mean, is she legally... Uh, you know uh, what's it oh, called? It's stolen. No, but I'm saying like, it's so did they, I, did they did they arrest her? Did they force well, her? Well, that's it. Now uh, she claimed she never knew that those items were stolen. No, I can't really tell for sure. Nobody actually can. I know that in the U.S. she uh, was prosecuted for attempting to sell stolen property, which is something that you're being prosecuted for even if you don't know that the items are stolen. Mm-hmm. But that was a relatively minor offense. I think she she. No, she she never served time. That was a relatively minor offense. And eventually, the story ended with the fact that the vast majority of the collection returned. I'd say 90% of the collection returned, which is something that almost never happens in art theft. If you have an art collection that returned after 25 years with that ratio of success, that's pretty amazing. Um, but eventually, the story was that in, in, terms, of, in, in terms of judicial pr- procedures... There was nothing really serious to do with that by that by then, since Lido worked completely alone and, and died. S- and died, yeah. And since she was the only one who had some awareness about that, and that's also questionable how much she knew and when, etc. So eventually, it, it, the the very fact that we had that back and the, the 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 items were restored and placed back in the museum, I think that's the greatest success. That's this amazing. episode there... took an interesting yeah. turn. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a movie about this guy's life? No, no. I, I had somebody, I, I had this Someone couple, needs to write a script. I had this American couple which said that their son-in-law was working as a scriptwriter in Hollywood, but they never returned. So they never never, never, never wrote well, me, so I don't know. If, if somebody was listening to that, if only we any knew idea. Two, so. If only we knew two filmmakers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, amazing. Okay. okay. So, uh, do you have like Twitter, Facebook? No, I have Facebook. I usually write in Hebrew. Hebrew. So pr- probably not, not very effective. But uh, first of all, we have the, the, the museum has, of course, everything. Well, Facebook, well, no, we don't have Twitter. Facebook and Instagram and, of course, the website is also in English. Mm-hmm. Most of the information that I told But you there. do lectures. No, I'm, I'm also, yeah, I'm, so I'm person, person I'm also doing lectures. So in if, English as well? Or yeah, well, I'm, I'm usually working in, in Hebrew and Russian, but as a tour guide, for example, I usually I work a lot in English. So, so if someone wants to bring you for a lecture, how can they contact you? No, I think mostly on Facebook. Yes, okay. and that with Jenny oh. Fruman. Um, yeah, so okay. I think I'll put your Facebook. Facebook. Yeah. And? Amazing. So before we go, we have a collaboration Genia, Genia with uh, okay. Let's for our listeners. How is it properly pronounced? That's supposed to be Genia because that's Genia. exactly that's Genia. that's Russian. That's uh, uh, sort of diminutive form of Yevgeny, which is the Russian version of Eugene. So essentially, when Americans like get com- get really confused. Uh, confused with my name, I just tell them call, call them to tell me Gene. Okay, <laughs> okay. So, so Genia. Yeah. So we have a collaboration with uh, the Jewish Journal, uh, JewishJournal dot com. They're a news uh, source out in L.A. Uh, so check them out. They have podcasts. They have columns. Uh, Shmuel Rosner's podcast, Rosner's oh. Domain. Um, will be our and, guests on the next yeah. episode. Oh, that's supposed to be very interesting. Yeah. So check them out. JewishJournal dot com. And we also collaborate with Arutz Sheva. True. They're at israelnationalnews.com yes and we they, just interviewed uh, one of their uh, uh yeah you uh, interviewed walter yeah, walter bingham and uh, they are also an amazing english uh, news source about israel and you should definitely check them out they're also on facebook 
and they help us out. So thanks. And we accept donations. So please go to twinjb.com slash donate. Help us out. We do this on our free time and every sum helps, especially if it's a big sum. <laughs> That's it. Thank, thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. That was very fun. That was very interesting. Thanks. Thank bye. you. Bye, guys.